And that way it's here on YouTube. We're going to talk about great insights into God, God's timing. What is God's timing all about? God has a time for everything. And a lot of times, most of the time, his timing is not our timing. So how do we deal with that? And we're going to look at some of that today in Ephesians chapter three. It's a very powerful text. I just want to remind everyone, hey, when we're here, it's uh, we're here for um, uh, the word of God. And I know that sometimes people say some derogatory things that come on into this live because it's open to anyone. And they may say some things that are painful, things that are really condescending and rude. Let's be respectful. We don't have to retaliate. Allow us to be like Christ and remain silent in most cases. Let us remain silent. Uh, God is good. God knows what he's doing. And we trust that. We don't have to be God, right? All right. So let's jump on in to Ephesians chapter three. Remember, we read Ephesians chapter two, which was a powerful text yesterday. And it talks about the dwelling of God, that God is building uh, God is building an incredible house for his spirit to reside. And he's building that with us. And it's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. This is powerful on the apostles and the prophets that God is using these individuals to make an outreach to us to build his temple, his spiritual temple through the participants in the word of God. Very powerful here. Now, when he jumps into the next section here in chapter three, we see why that God is building on the apostles and prophets. Watch what Paul says here in chapter three. He says, for this reason, right? What is that reason of building up God's family, building up God's temple so that God's spirit lives amongst our fellowship? Very powerful. The, the, the honor we have in, in, in being this temple, this modern temple for God. It's a, it's a high honor. And therefore, it's so important that we adhere to the prophets and the apostles' teaching. So watch what he says in Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, notice what he says, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. What is he getting at? Come on, Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. What is he getting at? He's saying here very clearly that he is a prisoner to the, to the will of Christ, and Christ revealed his will, which was what? That Paul would reach the Gentile community. What is he getting at here? That he has a purpose in life as an apostle. God has given him this purpose that he is a prisoner to Christ's ambition of what? The Gentiles, for the sake of the Gentiles. That's what we're dealing with here. Paul is shackled to the promise of Christ to reveal truth to the Gentiles. This is powerful. Thank you, Karen. Bullseye. This is powerful here, guys. Why? Because we have to find that will, that, that God intended will in our life and make ourselves prisoners to it. The calling that God has for you. That's what, that's what we've, we're seeking out in our life. And Paul realized that for him, it wasn't to be the Pharisee of Pharisees. It wasn't to be just an Old Testament scholar. That's, that's not what it was. His intended purpose for him was to be a, 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 an apostle to the Gentiles, to bring together Jew and Gentile, that they would become a housing for the Spirit of God. That is powerful in every way. The thing that's interesting here that we have to understand is that Paul's whole life was being crafted for this moment. Wow. His whole life was being crafted for this exact moment. When you read in Luke chapter 4, Jesus stands up and reads from the scroll of Isaiah, and he says that God is going to proclaim the year of his favor, and that uh, the blind should see, the lame should walk, those that are in prison should be set free. And he sits down and he says, today in your hearing, this is fulfilled. But the interesting verse before he reads that is that it says, Jesus had come up in Nazareth, and now he stepped forward and said, today this is fulfilled. Well, what does that mean? 
God was crafting his entire life for that moment, that moment of him beginning to proclaim the good news and to set hearts free that were in prison to sin. It's no different here with Paul. Paul says, for this reason, I am a prisoner. Well, what did God do in Paul's life? He trained him as an Old Testament scholar. He trained up under the philosophy of Gamaliel. He trained up under Hillel. Hillel, the, uh, a pioneer rabbinic teacher in the first century. And that's what he was training. All of his training was coming together for this moment. And the thing that's powerful about the training of Hillel, which Hillel was different than many of the other rabbinic scholars like Shammai. Shammai felt like Gentiles could never, ever be saved. But Hillel, the pioneer of Paul's training, he believed what? That Gentiles could be saved. So this whole time that Paul is training under him, that Paul is training under Hillel and Gamaliel, what is he training for? For this moment. This moment where in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then watch what he says in verse two. He says, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelations as I have already written briefly in my reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into what? The mystery of Christ which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by what? The Spirit of God's, listen to what he says, holy apostles and prophets. Wow, people. Incredible. What is he saying here? What is Paul getting at? Well, Paul is saying, surely you've heard about my administration in, in God's grace. Well, what was that administration? That he was called to be an apostle to whom? The Gentiles. That was an administration. That's what God had revealed. And he says, you've heard about it. Now, notice what he calls it. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. God made this mystery known to Paul by what? Revelation. This was not known to everyone. When, when Paul stepped on the scene, the... Um, the apostles and, and prophets in Jerusalem were like, what? They heard that the one that was persecuting the church is now a believer, is now proclaiming Jesus and him crucified. And this was astounding. They were like, what in the world is going on? Well, Paul speaks of this revelation. Well, what was it? Well, Jesus stopped him on the road to Damascus. And he says, you will be my messenger to the Gentiles. He tells him this. This is different. This is, this is really powerful in that God had an intended purpose. But the other thing here is that what? God had a mystery. You know, God has mysteries that he does not reveal to us. And, and, and you know, a lot of times that, that's hard to accept. We got to get over ourselves. God has many mysteries. And God is working always behind the scenes for God's intended purposes. Think about Joseph, the story of Joseph. Here he is. He's one of the 12. And, and Joseph is born, and he has no idea what's going on. But he catches a dream about his life that somehow, some way, uh, he's going to be great. And literally, his brothers will look at him in a whole different light. And he shares this, and it offends his brothers so much that they wind up selling him into slavery. So here's Joseph. He has no idea what God's intended purpose is, but what he finds himself is in a hole being sold to foreigners, sold as a slave by his own brothers. Now, here's his dad who loved Joseph. And when his brothers come back and share what uh, about Joseph, what do they tell him? They lie and say he was attacked by a wild animal and killed. And so there is great grief with his father over the fact that Joseph is dead. So he's like, what in the world is going on? And and But yet God had a mystery. God did not reveal to Joseph's father that he was alive. 
God did not reveal that he had a different plan to him at that moment. But think about the grief that the father went through. Think about the grief that Joseph went through. Here he is sold into slavery. Then he finally gets uh, bought again by Potiphar. And so what does Potiphar do? Well, Potiphar uses him as a servant, but yet things begin to go well. But then Potiphar's wife unjustly accuses him of, uh, of a sexual nature of advances. And then what does this do? This throws him in the dungeon. So here he is. He's sold into slavery, sold again. It seems like he's going to make it. Then back in a dungeon. I mean, you, you, you just don't know what God had planned for his life. And then finally, he gets out of the dungeon. Great things happen because of his ability to interpret dreams, which was the thing he couldn't do in the beginning. Remember, when he first had his dream, he couldn't interpret it. But now, God somehow, through all of that time, developed him in such a way that he could understand dreams, and that changed his life forever. Now he's elevated to the second level in charge in Egypt. And what was it for? Was it for him to be powerful, rich, and held in high honor? No, it was for God's people. So now his father can come and they and they get the land of Goshen. And it's there that the Israelites grow in fruitfulness. And you go, wow, so this was God's intended purpose that we would flourish here in Goshen. No, because they wind up becoming slaves there in Goshen, right? They become harshly treated. And you just go, what in the world is going on here? You know, God has a plan. And then we know the story. Now Moses is born. And then what happens? Moses leads them out of Egypt, right? And they get to Mount Sinai. The law is given. The, pro the, the promises now of the pro uh, prophecies are now beginning to make shape and form for what? The coming of Jesus. But all of this is a mystery. All of this, people don't know for generations and generations. God's timing is not our timing. And, and Paul introduces here, he says, look, you know, for whatever reason, God has decided that this is my administration. And now he says he, he revealed this mystery by revelation to me. And now notice he says in verse four, in the reading, in reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations. Wow. There are mysteries that will not be made known, you know, and, and, and this one is a real challenging one, because what is this mystery all about? Can the Gentiles be saved? Very powerful. Can they be saved? And that's, that's really the issue. Now, when you think about Jesus, when he leaves, you, you wonder, why didn't he just say, hey, Peter, by the way, the Gentiles can be saved. He doesn't do that. He does in a foreshadowing way. You will be my witnesses from here to Judea and Jerusalem. And he says Samaria. And then, you know, Samaria, you know, is on that Gentile side of life and all the world. He does say that, but they don't grasp that. They don't get that foreshadowing. And, and what does that mean? That God doesn't reveal things like we reveal things. God doesn't, he uses his own timing to reveal many mysteries. Now you look at this one and you go, but wait, you're, you're talking about a Jewish nation that had some serious prejudices towards foreigners or Gentiles, however you want to call them. And yet God did not make that clear. Why wouldn't God make that clear? Why would he wait for this moment? That That's the mystery. <laughs> that, that's the mystery. God has a plan. And, you know, sometimes um, things are very clear with regards to God's plan and God's intended purpose. And other times they are a mystery. They are a mystery. And 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 you have to trust the, the revelation or the revealing of God's plan. You have to trust that. We don't like that a lot of times. We We just want God to tell us what we want, when we want, and how we want. And God is like, no, there are mysteries. And, and the thing about this one that is so profound for me is the other apostles didn't know this. The other apostles didn't, but Paul knew this. 
and 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 that's a real challenging thing and we see that they had um great challenges with this influx of Gentiles being converted in the first century. Even when Peter goes and preaches to Cornelius, that first Gentile recorded conversion that we see, when he comes back, they're like, hey, wait, you went in the home of a Gentile? Like that was that was sacrilege. You don't do that. What are you doing? You know, and, and that was a huge breakthrough. And, and Peter said, look, God made it clear to me not to call any of what he created unclean. There was a shift. There was a change. You know, God makes changes on his own time. And thank you for the TJI. Thank you, Meg. Uh, he, he makes changes <clears throat> on his timing. And I know that sometimes we look at this and, and, and we think, well, he should do it all the time when we see fit. That's not how he works. God has a a a a, a plan that's outside of just you and I. And, and he understands the nature of people and the nature of his plan and how to best implement his plans and his vision. He knows how to do that. And it's on his timing. And we've got to trust that. Even when we look at certain things and we really have a difficult time understanding it. Wow, man. And this is, this is powerful. And in Ephesians chapter three, he says, this mystery made known. And I love what he says here in verse five. He says, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has been revealed by the spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. There are things in other generations that are not revealed until these guys came and revealed it by the apostles and the prophets. Wow. Very, very, very powerful. This answers a lot of questions that the naysayers give about the Old Testament. You know, um, you, you can always scroll through lives and debates. And what do we see? Well, we usually see a non-believer or an atheist or some skeptic of the Bible or critic of the Bible, what do they say? They say, your God condones slavery. They, he condones slavery, owning people, and they're so convinced of their position on God. And they go, look at what God has done. Look, look at this. You can't justify that your God is what? immoral. No, God has decided that he's going to reveal a mystery about these things and many other things on his timing. And who does he use to reveal these mysteries? The apostles and the prophets. That's who he uses. He's talking specifically about these in the first century. They are the ones that are going to bring what was known as a mystery, clarity. This is why when people come to me and they say, your God condones slavery, I say, what does the first century apostles and prophets say about the old law? Because the only place they get that is in the old law. That's where they get it. That's where they live. That's where the skeptics camp out on slavery and things of that nature. And they just go, see, see, see. But then the mystery of all of that is revealed through whom? The apostles and the prophets. And that's why I go to what does Paul say in Galatians? Paul clearly says what he says about the law. He says, weak and miserable. His description of it is weak and miserable. The Hebrew writer, what does he say? It is obsolete. It served its purpose at its time. Paul also says, well, why, they asked Paul, well, why, if you say these things are weak and miserable, why were they implemented? Why? And Paul literally says, here's the apostle and the prophet. Here is the re revelation of the mystery of why these things were implemented. He says, because you were out of control. Paul says, your sins, your, your, your transgressions were out of control, and you needed something to control them so that the lineage of Christ may be preserved, that we all may have forgiveness. 
wow, this is how you deal with these skeptics and these folks who condemn God because they read Leviticus chapter 25. Their problem is they don't know the mysteries of God that has been revealed through whom? The apostles and the prophets. And this is where you go. And so when you look at that, you just go, wait a minute. So God, notice this, and, 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 and it says it right here in Ephesians chapter 3. Notice what he says in verse 5, which was not made known to people in other generations. So clearly, the, the apostle Paul, a prophet and an apostle, is saying something. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. What is he saying? He's saying that there are things that just were not revealed in other generations. They were not revealed. God did not reveal it. And you know what? You're going to have to get over it because God has an intended purpose that far supersedes you. It far supersedes your intellect, your understanding, your wisdom. That's the reality. And Paul writes it here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5. He says, there were things that were not made known to people in other generations as they have been revealed through what? By the Spirit of God, through his holy apostles and prophets. That is the answer. And so I always go, when someone comes to me and says, well, what about a Leviticus chapter 25? Or what about 1 Samuel chapter 15? And they always, they, they say, look at this, look at this. And I go, what do the apostles say about those things? And they don't know. I say, what do what does the apostle Paul say about these things? What do the prophets say about those things? They don't know. They don't have an answer. What they have is their own critical thought. What they have is their blindness to the mysteries of God. And that's not my issue. My issue is not to uh, fix their blindness. My issue is not to fix their hard heart. That's not my issue. My issue is to say, what do the apostles and the prophets say? That God has given wisdom to reveal what was not revealed to previous generations. Smoke daddy. <laughs> Smoke daddy. That's all I got. That's all I got. And I'm going to bring that out every time. And let me tell you something. People don't like it. They don't like it. Thanks for the hearts, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, if you're listening to this, and let me tell you something. If you're getting something out of this, then do me right. Follow. Click the follow. Do me right. If you're getting something out of this, do me right. Click the follow. Why? So let me know that there are folks out there that like this. Not only that, but that this is helping folks to get this out. Because the algorithm, when you click the follow, the algorithm says, hey, there's a lot of people that like what's happening in this live, and they get this message out. I want more of this kind of teaching out here in this form of social media. I want it out here and I need your help. And you can help me by clicking the follow. When you click the follow, it changes the algorithm. It lets the algorithm know there are more and more people that are finding this information good. Help me out. If I'm helping you out, help me out. If I'm giving you insight and giving you things in the biblical text that you did not know before, help me out by following. Click the follow. You can also become a, a team member. We got 80 team members right now. The team member is growing. Let's get to 100. Come on, guys. Let's get to 100 today. It's only 20 more people. And I know there's 20 people on here right now that are not team members. Go ahead. Click the team. Click the heart up here. Become a team member. I know there's 20 of you out there. It doesn't cost you a dime. I think it's, I think it's free. You just come on and become a team member. And then that's going to help what? The algorithm is going to tell them. We got a lot of people that are liking what he's doing. They're liking what he's doing. And I want to get this truth out because there's a generation of folks that are coming up, a generation of the youth that has no idea about what's in the Bible. And they are being tortured by these folks on social media that are spewing all kinds of lies, condescending nature about God, about the scriptures, and they're ruining these kids. These kids who have no moral values, they have no moral compass, and they're telling them to shun the word of God. They're telling them that this is all a, a lie, this is all fake, this is all mythology, and they have zero proof for that. But because these young people don't know the word of God, they are believing it, and therefore they're rejecting God. 
They're rejecting our creator. They're rejecting the story of the gospel. Why? Because they're saying it's of no moral value. Why? Because they don't know the word of God. And when people throw up contentious ideas and thoughts about the Bible, we don't know the scriptures, so we have no means of responding to them. And so these people are then being led astray. And I need your help. How do you help? Click to follow. Click to follow. We get more folks following this, then more people will hear the truth about the scriptures. That's what you can do. You can help me out. If you're not a team member, become a team member. Click that. You can also give gifts. The gifts, what do they do? They support this work. I, I want to really go after this in a way that really is massive and makes a difference. You give gifts, give hot dogs. I put the hot dog up there. That hot dog is pretty cool, the dancing of it. You can become a monthly subscriber to support the work that we're doing here. Thank you, Jenny. You can become a monthly subscriber. You can give gifts, all that. Click the screen, click the screen. It doesn't take anything. What does it do? It helps to build the ministry of what we're doing here. All right, let's keep going. Verse four, in your reading of this, you will be able to understand my insight, Ephesians chapter three, verse four, into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has been revealed by the spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. Verse six, this mystery is that through the gospel, here it is, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Imagine how many relationships are brought back together. Come on, Jeff. Imagine how many relationships now that have been broken because of racial tension between Jew and Gentile. He's saying in Christ, these have been brought together. And it's a promise in Christ. What a powerful statement that Paul is making. What is he saying? He's saying the bottom line is that we can heal racial relationships through Christ. They did it there. And there was a great tension between Jew and Gentile. I mean, you're talking about, I'm not even going in the house of a Gentile. And now God has transformed that and changed that in an incredible way. And Paul is saying, man, I am the one that God has chosen to have this mystery or, or have this ministry uh, in his life. Very powerful. Verse seven, he says, I became what? Oh, thanks, Meg. Thank you. Thank you. He says, I became a servant of this gospel. This is what he's saying. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through what? The working of his power. This is very powerful. You know, we all have a gift. We all have a ministry. We all have something that God has given to us based on the gifts and talents that we have. And I love what Paul says, I became a servant of this gospel. I became a servant of it. God is telling us, what, some simple things, man, that I have crafted you for a service of ministry. What has God called you to do? What has God uh, uh, pricked in your heart and in your soul to become a servant of? And I love what Paul says, I'm a servant of this gospel. He's all in. His whole life revolved around this ministry that God had given him. God has given you all gifts. Thank you, Colette, for the gift. I appreciate it. God has given all of us gifts and talents for a specific purpose in service of Christ. What is it? What's the thing that's on your heart? What's the thing that pulls at your mind, your, your mind when you're thinking? What is it? Is it serving the poor and needy? Is it serving those that are in financial distress? Is it is it giving comfort to those who mourn, those who are lost? Thank you, Heather. Thank you. What is it? What is it? What is that thing that pulls on your heart? This may be the service that God has crafted you specifically for. And I know, I love what Paul says. He says, I became a servant of this gospel by the grace, by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. He became a servant of it. He, you know, you give yourself wholeheartedly to these things. What God has, has crafted you for or gifted you for, you do what? You give yourself wholeheartedly to it. Wow. And, and when you do that, boy, you find that purpose in life. You find that, that area in your life that is that, that you're filled, consumed. Your, your zeal for God is very powerful and it moves. And God moves through you very powerfully to make change. Verse eight, although I am least, those, oh, I'm sorry, although I am less than least of all of the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to what? 
to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Wow. Notice what he says. He says, man, I'm the least of the Lord's people. Why? There was great guilt that he felt, great guilt that he felt with regards to his persecution of disciples of Jesus. And he felt it, man. It was, it was in his mind, he was like, how in the world can I look at these people that I absolutely persecuted? He, he put them in court. He gave his testimony when Stephen was stoned to death. And, I, and that death, it shook him up even in his latter years. He makes reference to that. And so that's why he calls himself less than the least of all of the Lord's people. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles what? The boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept, here it is again, was kept hidden in God who created all things. Verse nine of Ephesians chapter three clearly lets us know that God keeps certain things hidden. And you know, I think a lot of times we find ourselves uh, trying to justify the fact that God doesn't reveal all things. There are things that God just doesn't reveal. There are things that God keeps hidden. And then, and people want to get upset, uh, usually the naysayers, usually those who don't believe in God, the skeptics of the Bible, they get upset because they don't have an answer that they're looking for. God keeps things hidden. That's just what he does. God will keep things hidden. He will reveal them when he feels like it's time to reveal them. And then people get mad. They get mad. And this is the thing, right? What was Adam and Eve's issue in the garden? What was their issue in the garden? Satan gives Eve this last uh, tantalizing thought that ruined her. And what was it? He knows you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, you will be like God, knowing all things. This is what we want. We want to be in a position of being like God, knowing all things. And there are things that are kept hidden. There are things that are just kept hidden. And, and you know, what are you going to do about that? You, you can get upset about that. You can complain about that. You can judge God about that. But the, the Apostle Paul is letting us know that there are things that are hidden. And then he puts this in great perspective. I love what he says here in Ephesians 3, verse 9. He says, which for, uh, which for ages past was kept hidden in God. And then he says something about God, who created all things. <laughs> I love this. He just helps us to go, look, the bottom line is the dude that's holding this hidden from you, guess what? He created all things. There is a reason that God is able to hold back revealing certain things. Why? He's the creator of all things. Just be mindful of that, that he is so powerful. He's got infinite wisdom, infinite might. He's seen the end of the story. Why? He created all things. And if he deems it necessary to keep certain things hidden, then you need to be okay with that. Why? Look at what he's done. He's the creator of all things things. Wow. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities. Now watch what he says in the heavenly realms. Now this gives us an insight into what God is doing and why certain things are hidden from us. Look at what he says here. He says, these things were kept hidden. And why? Verse 10, his intent was that now, what? Through the church, the church was going to do something. What was the church going to do? Well, one, it was the manifold wisdom of God. In other words, it was the fulfillment of God's wisdom should be made known to whom? Who is he? What is this purpose that he intended in the church? Who is it to be known for or made known to? The rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realm. Wait a minute. What? What God was doing here on earth through the Gentiles and the Israelites coming together was what? His intended purpose was to do what? Ooh, to make known to the heavenly realms. Who? The rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. There are rulers 
and there are authorities in the heavenly realm. There are things going on in the heavenly realm that we have no idea about. We have absolutely no idea about. When it comes to the heavenly realms, we've got no idea what's going on there. And notice what, what he says here. Paul gives us a glimpse of a couple of things there. Rulers and authorities. That there's something going on there that the manifold wisdom of God here on earth through the church is giving them insight. It is teaching them a lesson. God does not tell us what that lesson is. God does not explain what's going on in the heavenly realms with rulers and authorities. Why? One, we probably can't understand it. We have no idea what's going on there. The rulers up there, what are they ruling over? The authorities over there, what are their authorities over? Who are they? What are these beings? What are these beings in this heavenly realm? Well, we have no idea. It makes no sense to us. Jesus gives us insight into this. Why? When he's being arrested and he's before Pilate, and Pilate asks him if he's a king, he goes, look, my kingdom is not of this world. This, this, this If it were, look, my angels would, would read some damage right now, but this is not my kingdom. It is not of this world. So what is Jesus in helping us to understand? That there is something on the other side that we have no idea about. We have absolutely no idea. And to try and explain it is so confusing that it's baffling to my mind. You want, want proof of that? Read Revelations. I mean, we read Revelations. I mean, there's so many books written about it. Why? Because there's a lot of strange stuff going on up there, stuff that we have no idea of comprehending. And it's crazy. And John is trying to convey things about the heavenly realm just to help us in our life there. And it is one of the most confusing things that you'll ever read in the Bible. And, and now what do we see here? Well, God is helping us to understand something here. And what is it? that there are rulers in the heavenly realms and authorities that are learning lessons from what? The manifold wisdom of God in the church here on earth. And this is why God does certain things here on earth that he doesn't reveal to us. Well, one, we, we probably can't understand it. We have no composition, no, no, no ability to comprehend what is going on up there. But God knows that whatever he is asking us to do down here, is having an effect on those in the heavenly realm. Now, why is that needed? Why is uh, uh, our life to have an effect on the heavenly realm? Well, think about it. What ruined the world that we live in? Genesis chapter three. It was this individual, the Satan, if you will, that decided to act in such a way in rebellion to God on what? God's people. There's something going on in the heavenly realm and how some of these entities feel about what? Creation of mankind. We see that. There is something there that has caused some friction. And we know that the Satan, what? Thousands have followed him. We also know in Genesis chapter 6 that somehow these divine beings, these, these beings from heaven came down and did what? Made it with women here on the earth. And when, uh, when Peter talks about it, uh, when Jude talks about it, they say these guys, they left their place, what, of authority. They had a place of authority, and they left that. And God speaks about them being cast into dungeons. There is stuff going on in the heavenly realm that we know nothing about, but we play a part in resolving it by our response to Jesus Christ, by how we live. And the, and the order which, which God has brought this, the story of our life from Abraham on or from Genesis on, depending on how you want to look at it, is a story that is proclaiming a message to some in this heavenly realm, to the rulers and authorities there. And because we don't know, doesn't mean that it is not real. And Paul is revealing a hidden mystery for us to resolve. Now, what does this mean? This means that we need to be obedient to God because you have no idea what God is doing. God is doing some things that he will reveal when we see him in heaven. They're going to blow our mind. It's just going to blow our mind. 
And, and we think that we're so <laughs> intellectually gifted or we're so filled with wisdom that we must be in the know. God is not asking us to sit at the table. You've not been invited to sit at the table and reason with God and come up with a plan. You're not a part of that plan. You, you, you're incapable of being a part of that plan. God knows what he's doing. And God has sent his prophets and his apostles to instruct us. And we need to be in obedience to their teaching. And Paul gives us a glimpse. Why? Should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Wow. Very, very powerful. Verse 11, according to his, his what? Listen to his purpose according to his eternal purpose, according to what? His eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. But what is God's plan here? God's plan is a eternal plan. God's plan is not a carnal plan. We think so much, and this is what gets skeptics all messed up, is because they think that God's plan is a carnal plan. That God's end game is peace here on earth. God's end game is not peace here on earth. Matter of fact, God's end plan is to destroy this earth and destroy heaven. He says, I'm going to destroy this earth and heaven and create a new heaven and a new earth. That is God's plan. But when you think that God's plan is a carnal plan for our hundred years of life here on this earth, you're messed up. Then when you read the scriptures, the scriptures make no sense. The plan that God has in the text makes no sense if you think that God's plan is a carnal plan for 100 years or on this earth. And this is why skeptics get all messed up. They go, well, there's evil on earth, so therefore there's no God. Um, uh, uh, what is the guy? Um, the the astrologist, uh, Tyson. Uh, he, he, he makes that claim. Many. Um, uh, I think this is why Dr. Bart Arman does not believe in God, because of the, the issue of evil on this earth. And they always want to come up with this argument. If God is so powerful, he should stop evil on this earth. But see, what they don't understand is God's purposes are what? Eternal purposes. God's plan is an eternal plan. It's not a hundred year plan. And God is looking at those that want to judge him on that as like they're idiots. He's like, what in the world? Why would I wrap myself up with a hundred year plan when I know, thank, thank you, Neil Tyson Degrassi, thank you, thank you. Um, why would I wrap myself up with a hundred year plan where I got eternity to look at? God is like, that is so stupid and foolish. But well, why is that? Well, because we're so self-focused. Our focus is on us. And Paul is revealing here in, in Ephesians that there is a bigger uh, picture to this of things that you don't even understand. And they're, two, and they're twofold. There's rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, and there's an eternal purpose. There's an eternal purpose. Wow. That can only be accomplished. Now, here's the powerful thing through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, here's the thing. The answer to all the problems in the heavenly realms and the authorities and the rulers in the heavenly realms and the issues here on earth, the real answer is who? Jesus Christ. This figure that we got the chance to learn from came here on earth. Wow, man. Powerful. He is reconciling the earth and the heavenly realms. There is reconcili reconciliation only found in this figure, Jesus Christ. So the idea that you don't spend time studying out who this Christ figure is, is crazy. Are you serious to neglect this one, this individual who is reconciling everything here on earth and in the heavenly realms? Wow. I, 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 why would I not hang on every word, right? Why would I not hang on every word of this figure, Jesus? That is what Paul is proclaiming. That is what he's bringing to the table for folks. Thanks, guys, for the roses. Thank you. He is bringing this to the table, to the forefront, so that we understand the value that is in this Christ figure, the value that is in this Jesus. And I love what he says, Jesus Christ, who? 
our Lord. Man, talk about putting him in a spot, man. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you. Talk about putting him in a spot, man, of lordship. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 12, in him and through faith in him, we may what? Approach God with freedom and confidence. Wow. When you think about all the stuff that's going on here on the earth, when you think about all the unseen things that are going on in the heavenly realms with the rulers and authorities, he says, let me tell you something. If you can get to God, and I love what he says, you can approach him with freedom and confidence through what? Through our faith in him. Through that adherence to the Lordship of Christ through us giving ourselves over to Christ and the Lordship of Christ, we can approach God with what? Wow, confidence and freedom. You, you, you have free access. You don't have to wait in line. You know, you go to the deli, you gotta get a ticket, you're waiting in line, trying to figure out what you want. You, you don't have to wait in line. You have front, front door access, and not only you have front door access, he says you can have confidence. Like, like God's not going to just shun you off. God's not just going to say, you know, who are you? Get away. But through our adherence to his son, you know, this faith or this belief, literally in the Greek, it's obedience. It's a, it's a commitment to, it is an adherence to his teaching, to his word. We gain free access. Verse 13 of Ephesians chapter three, he says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of what my suffering for you, which is for your glory. Now, why does he bring this in? Well, because what happens is when we find ourselves suffering, when we find ourselves in adverse situations, what do we do? We tend to go, where is God? We tend to think God is not blessing, or God is not there, or God does not hear us. Well, he just gave an incredible uh, uh, picture of God's eternal purposes, that there are things going on in heaven that we know nothing about, but we play an intricate part in how we respond here on earth. And so he says, look, so don't worry about my suffering for your glory. It, 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 it's okay. This is a part of God's plan. And Paul is saying, I'm a living testimony of faith. Wow, very powerful. Verse 14 of Ephesians chapter three. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family, watch what he says, in heaven and earth derives its name. Listen at what he's saying. Listen at what he says. I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven, there are families in heaven. I don't know what that means. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Wow. I, I, he, he doesn't tell us what this means. He doesn't give us a description of what this means. But what he does do is let us know that there are things going on up there like family and names up there. And you just got to trust God's plan. God is saying there's certain things I'm just not going to reveal to you because they would mess you up. You don't understand. Even Paul in Corinthians, what does he say? He says, I was caught up to the third heaven and I heard things that man is not permitted to speak on. Man is not permitted to speak on. Paul says, I heard some things, and he's given us some kind of glimpse. Look, there are things up there like family that we know nothing about, and I'm going to trust that and use that as what? Confidence in what I'm doing down here. God has a great plan for us here on earth. Wow. It just encourages my soul. It encourages me to be faithful to God, and it encourages me what? Notice what he says, to kneel before the Father. What is he talking about? To honor, to respect, to pray to God, because God has got something going on. Verse 16, what does he say? I pray, I pray what? That out of his glorious riches, he may do what? May strengthen you with power through what? His spirit, where? In your inner being. Why? You're hearing these things. 
you should be encouraged and strengthened in your inner being through what is spirit so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. What are we talking about here? The Christ-like mentality in our heart, faithful to Christ. Wow, man, so that we may grow and mature and be strengthened. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have what? Power. I love it. Together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp what? How wide, how long, how high, how deep is what? The love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses what? The love of Christ surpasses knowledge. In other words, it's far beneficial <laughs> than knowledge to be focused on what? Christ's love for you. You don't have to know all things, but this one thing you need to know is Christ's, Christ's love for you. That you may be filled to what? The measure of all the fullness of God. What is he talking about? Maturing in God, the fullness of God, just like Christ. Verse 20. Now, I love this. To him who is able to do what? Immeasurably more than we all we ask or imagine according to his power. That is at work within who? Within us. God is working within us. Do you understand why we have the Spirit of God? Why we need the full measure of God's power? Why that transformation that happens in us, in us is beneficial for those that are here on earth and the rulers and authorities in heaven. We don't know how that is, but trust God in this. Therefore, your obedience, your compliance to the Lordship of Christ is pivotal for that. Verse 21, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout what? Some generations, most generations? No, all generations forever and ever. And the church said, amen. <laughs> Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians, I mean, wow. Whoa, people. <laughs> I hope you loved it. I mean, wow. I mean, is that not an incredible text? Is that not a text that reveals things that you just go, you have got to be kidding me. It, it opens up your eyes to a whole new world, a whole new heavenly dwelling that God is doing some things that we have no idea about. God is doing things that are absolutely outstanding, incredible, powerful, yes, I mean, it's just like, so why? So when you're in your, your hardest moments of faith, when you're in your hardest moments of, should I repent? Should I follow Jesus? Should I do what the Bible says? Then you know there's a whole lot more at stake. There's a whole lot more at stake. And therefore, give yourselves unto God fully. Don't allow yourself, you know, sometimes you can read a passage in a scripture and it confronts you about certain things in your life, and you don't want to change, or you run away from it, or you're fearful of it. Listen, there's a whole lot at stake, and God is calling you to trust yourself unto his teaching. And I love that Paul starts off this chapter, and he says, look, these things are revealed through the apostles and the prophets. So what the apostles and the prophets reveal is God's intended purposes for what you to know, for what you, how much you should know. What he has not revealed for them, God does not intend for you to know. That's, that's just the way it is. God has got a plan for all of us. And God is going to give us what we need to know when we need to know it. And we got to trust that. That is the might and the power of God. And I tell you, man, that, my friend, is incredible. If you like what you're hearing, go ahead, like and subscribe. Be a part of the party. Be a part of the solution by knowing God's word. That's why we do this every morning on TikTok, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're always here as long as God allows us.